Welcome back to New Rockstars. This is The Big Question. It's a show that gives you too much information about how the various Spider-Man movies have actually been quietly referencing each other from the beginning, setting up a live-action Spider-Verse where we will see which Peter Parker is the stickiest. Peter? What's going on in there? <laughs> I'm Eric Voss, here with me, in the first time for Big Question, off-screen producer Zach Huddleston, and I think now we should start calling you on-screen producer, right? You know what, Eric, off-screen is more a state of mind. Off-screen. Zach's gonna handle the big question for us this week, because you know we've been going back through the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies on the channel lately, going from Spider-Man Far From Home, we realized there's some crazy connections that we didn't really see before. So Zach, my question for you is, how are all the Spider-Man movies connected in a live action Spider-Verse? Yes, and this has been a hot topic of conversation recently, right? And there's a couple things that are gonna come up shortly. You know, the Morbius trailer, the Into the Spider-Verse animated oh, right, movie, yeah. the Sam Raimi being the director for Doctor Strange 2. There's all these kind of things that are leading a lot of people to speculate, like, could we get a live action Spider-Verse? Is there already a live action Spider-Verse? So uh, I'm going to, uh, you can see this board behind me. This is actually not my research board for this project. I'm a... Uh, uh, pitching a, a remake of David Lynch's Dune. But why? Not the upcoming <laughs> Denis Villeneuve or whatever. This is just, I just want to recut. Oh, uh, they, they scooped you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm basically, I'm getting out the red yarn, but in this case, the red yarn is thwip, thwip, is gonna be uh, spider oh, webs. Nice. Yes. Did you feel that? Do, do you have a, a- Yeah, oh, I felt it. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I, that was a real off-screen thwip there. And so we're going to try to uh, thwip our way through the Spider-Verse. Uh, first, to kind of uh, lay out the different universes we're gonna be connecting. So the, the big ones that we're gonna be talking about, of course there's the, the original Sam Raimi, Tobey Maguire trilogy, Spider-Man 1, 2, and 3. Okay. And, and we're right. not gonna use this number a lot, but for, for the, the eggheads out there, that's Earth 96283 is kind of the Marvel okay. designation. They designate all their different timelines and universes, yeah. right? So that's a big one. Obviously the current one, the Tom Holland MCU uh, timeline, right? right? He's showing up in Avengers movies. He's showing up in his own solo films. That is Earth 199999, five nines, right? Uh, and that yeah. also encompasses the entire MCU, the Iron Man movies, Thor, everything. Now, yes. and, and this is where it's, it's already gonna get weird here, but there's a separate, adjunct universe for the Spider-Man villain oh, movies. Yeah, they're kind of connected, but we don't really know how exactly. Yeah, and, and like back in, I, I like the term adjunct because it both makes me uh, sound <laughs> professorial, but also Amy Pascal uh, at Sony used that term when describing kind of these movies oh, nice. in an interview with like Kevin Feige back in like 2017 before Venom came out. So like, it seems like it kind of works. Like they're technically adjacent to the MCU. They don't um, contradict anything in the MCU. Though they also don't necessarily like, they're not showing up in each other's movies yet, right? Spider-Man has yet to be okay. in a Venom movie. Though that, that might change. We'll talk about that in a second. So that that is mm -hmm. Earth 1999999 adjunct or Earth TRN688 is the kind of technical uh, name for That's it. That's the Marvel de designation. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. I love I love the term adjunct. Can I just jump in on this? Because I think, to me, that's like Amy Pascal as Dwight Schrute to Michael Scott. <laughs> like, I'm the assistant to the regional universe. I can't imagine this place without you. Can't you? And then they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. She's like, but uh, this is my universe too, right? Yeah, I'll just hang out at this party and before anyone notices me and kicks me out. They're just so desperate to be in the like same zip code as the MCU, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 like that's right, that's during right. Woodstock, Amy Pascal was in Buffalo. And so she's like, I was at Woodstock, <laughs> basically. You know, speaking of Buffalo, <laughs> shout out Bill's Army. Got my Josh Allen jersey here. Uh, sent to me by a fan, <laughs> um, Mark, shout out, shout out Tommy Bechtel, Bill's, Bill's Army everywhere. Okay, but back to the list here. <laughs> nice. uh, uh, so then we, we have the, specifically the film animated universe that as of right now just has Into the Spider-Verse 1, right? There's a lot of other TV shows that are animated movies, things like that, but we're just talking about that um, Into the Spider-Verse, Miles Morales, animated universe, Earth TRN 700, which is actually kind of an adaptation of the comics Ultimates Universe, Earth 1610. 
Yeah, it's kind of confusing because within that universe, they show the different like Spider Verses. You have the Spider Ham's universe, you have Penny Parker's universe, and you have Earth sixteen ten, and I think you have the original six one six in there. So that's all kind of contained within this corner of it. Yeah, that it's just Miles's universe, right? Is the is the one we're uh -huh. kind of talking about? He could technically connect yeah. to all these other ones, but like his kind of base level is Earth. TRN 700 or whatever. Um, and then uh, continuing, we have the Andrew Garfield's Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2. Yes, that happened. Earth <laughs> 120703. It also has like the least coherent number. And then also kind of the video game world. And there's been a lot of uh, different yes. Spider-Man video games. This is, we're mostly gonna focus on the most recent PS4 video game that a lot of people loved and played, right? And maybe oh, that'll yeah. also connect and to the upcoming PS5. Yeah, the game. Miles Morales one, yeah. Things we're not gonna be trying to connect, right? Obviously the original comics, which, you know, there's tons of comics connections to all of this work, right? It's kind of all the bases. Mm -hmm. the, the 60s animated TV show, the 70s live action TV show, Japanese Spider-Man, any kind of recent Disney XD or something, yeah. you know, we're, we're not gonna think about that. Just things that have come out as, as films, okay? Wait, so you're not gonna do the Universal Studios <laughs> Islands of Adventure ride? That's not gonna tie in? <laughs> that legit made me barf. And I'm not, I'm not talking about um, Quentin Beck's technology. I'm talking about the stuff that comes out of your mouth when you get motion sickness. So. Uh, we, we've established our, our six universes now, the connections kind of between these universes and the ways that these universes reference each other, right? And kind of the most important one, the Ur text of Spider-Man films is that Sam Raimi trilogy, right? It was kind of the yeah. first big screen appearance of Spider-Man. Everything that's come after that is kind of a reference to that. Even when it's technically a comic book reference, it's really a reference to Sam Raimi's comic book reference. They loom just so large yeah. in our pop culture psyche. They're either borrowing from it or responding to it, you know? Yes. Like, well, they already did it that way, so now we're gonna do it this way. And the biggest one, kind of one that's on the top of a lot of our minds since Spider-Man Far From Home, J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. He's a menace to the entire city! J.K. Jonah Jameson. He played that role in the original trilogy, and we see him in the post credit scene or mid credit scene of Far From Home, right, as this kind of new Alex Jones style, J. Jonah Jameson, right. breaking the news wow. of Peter Parker's real identity. And so, like, that's clearly a connection, right? You don't cast the exact same actor in the exact same role unless you want there to be like a direct reference, right? And you've pointed out in your videos, Eric, that like, well, he has a slightly different take on the character. We don't know that he's the exact same J. Jonah Jameson, but it does seem like obviously that's what they're aiming for. There's a rumor that he is gonna show up in that role in the Morbius movie, which would be oh, cool. really big because we're already with connecting MCU to Raimi-verse, right? But that would connect MCU to Raimi-verse, Raimi-verse to Villain-verse, right? Which we don't have a direct connection between those yet. And also, it seems like there was some kind of like Spider-Man hate in that graffiti, right? In the Morbius trailer. Maybe that could be what that's referring to. People are just whipped up by uh, by Alex Jones, J. Jonah Jameson. Yes, right? It's it, Murderer is scrawled on the Spider-Man poster in the background as Morbius is running down an alley. And, you know, there's no other reason that we know of in the Morbius universe that people would be calling Spider-Man a murderer, right? Other than J. Jonah kind of outing him for the death of Mysterio, Mysterio kind of planting that, right? So it seems like that that's gonna be a direct connection between the Morbius kind of villain verse and the uh, MCU Tom Holland Spider-Verse. I'm gonna be making fun hand motions for all of these connections. <laughs> There you have it, folks, conclusive proof. Speaking of Raimi verse connections, right? We have one of the best, because I'm, I'm a professional wrestling fan. So Bonesaw McGraw, who is the character that Macho Man Randy Savage, rest in peace, Randy Poffo, uh, played yeah. in the original Spider-Man. And that showed up on the kind of the, the subtext of a wrestling poster in Far From Home. That's right. Same guy existed, but and, and that was an original thing. Like they had Crusher Hogan on that poster who's from the comics, but like they turned Crusher Hogan into Bonesaw McGraw in the Raimi movie. It was an original creation for the Raimi-verse that is also now in the MCU. That's pretty wild. And again, yeah. maybe that's just a lot of these you could easily write off as like, these are just like the art department wanted to sneak in a little reference, but of course, that's not fun. It's much more fun <laughs> yeah. to be like Randy Savage existed in this world with Tom Holland and Nick Fury and everything else. <laughs> Speaking of which, right, like 
maybe the iconic moment from the first Spider-Man movie and just like an indelible part of pop culture now, the upside down kiss, right? Like That's that is, is maybe like the thing people picture when they picture those Raimi movies and everybody's tried to recreate it to much awkward effect, okay? A couple people probably have concussions yeah. out there from attempting their own upside down <laughs> kiss. You can do it. <laughs> and so that has shown up almost everywhere, right? Obviously it originated in the Raimi-verse, but then in the animated, Peter B. Parker references that. You see, I saved the city, fell in love. Right, like we see All that right, was yeah. the origin of his relationship with MJ, right? Mary Jane, right? They recreate that kiss. It's teased in Spider-Man Homecoming. Kiss her. <laughs> they don't end up kissing, but that was clearly a reference to that. So does Karen know about the Raimi verse? Yeah, she's seen the Raimi movies. <laughs> hey, you know, there was another one that I spotted when we went back through Far From Home. When Peter kisses MJ on Tower Bridge in London, there's a, a car that's flipped over next to them that has uh, the license plate number. It's like ASM143, which is the issue where Peter Man kisses MJ, but the car is upside down. So I feel like that's also a possible reference to like the upside down kiss. Like MJ, they don't kiss upside down, but the car is, that's referencing their kiss. Like why flip the car? You know, am I stretching? Is that a thwip? Is that a reach? Thwip? <laughs> yeah, thwip, thwip. I mean, I'm, I'm being very generous with my thwips. Okay, so you, <laughs> you throw in a thwip, I thwip, <laughs> our thwips meet in the middle. So then uh, a few other recent um, MCU references to the Raimi verse, right? You among other people have pointed out when um, Peter's packing for Europe, right? His suitcase says uh, BFP, a reference mm. to probably Uncle Ben, right? Ben F. Parker. Yeah, Ben F. Parker. <laughs> that dude parties. <Yeah. laughs> wow! Oh no! <laughs> Guys, I just thought of the funniest thing. What you say? He parties and he dies, just like uh, John <laughs> Lennon and Jim Morrison and all the greats before him. But, like, we haven't seen a Ben Parker in the current MCU iteration, right? Like, we haven't seen yeah, an Uncle yeah. Ben. So it's like, well, maybe we're just too... That's the image we still have in our mind of that original actor, right, from the first Spider-Man movie. Yeah, no one's thinking of uh, uh, Martin Sheen <laughs> on that suitcase. <laughs> Poor Martin Sheen in Sally Field, right? She was Aunt May in yeah. those two movies. I mean, great actors. Yeah. Great actors throughout those movies. It's just, uh, yeah. we know. We know. For another quick um, side note from Florida that will definitely be cut out of this episode, it's always hard to be the middle, right? Like the middle between two greats is like the worst possible spot. And I'm thinking specifically of Ron Zook. And this is for all my deep uh, Florida football fans, right? <laughs> the most famous like Florida football coach of all time was this guy, Steve Spurrier. And then the next most famous was this guy, Urban Meyer. And then in between them yeah. was this guy, Ron Zook, who was a fine, he was fine. He was an okay coach, right? But people- He was fine, he went on to do some great stuff. Yeah, and I mean, long had, career. He went to Illinois, <laughs> had that upset against Ohio State that one yes. season, big time. Still working as of the most recent uh, NFL season, by yeah. the way. Um, but like, between those two giants, you'll always look like an ant. You know what I mean? Ants. Ants. And so it is like those amazing right. Spider-Man movies, because the Raimi ones are so beloved and so kind of like historically important, and the Tom Holland MCU ones are so great on their own, like you're always gonna pale in comparison. Yeah. Thank you for putting it in, in Florida talk. Maybe you notice I'm drinking a nice Florida Gators a cup of water. Ooh. I carry swamp water with me everywhere. It's our Bobby <laughs> Boucher water. We just every every Florida graduate has to carry a little vial of it on him at all times. Because you it's, never know. It's fetid. It's uh, mostly algae. <laughs> and it's and it's in a, a, every bottle of Gatorade has some of it. <laughs> Down here, we call it Gatorade. <laughs> no Powerade in Florida. It's the OG. Uh, yeah. It's Gatorade or it's nothing. It's nerf or nothing. <laughs> okay, and so then another kind of series of thwip, thwip, thwips, right, are all centered around Donald Glover. I like Brit. There was kind of that big oh, yeah. campaign as they were recasting Spider-Man after Toby and, and the Raimi, you know, crew moved on. There was this kind of fan campaign to get Donald Glover cast as Spider-Man. It was kind of concurrent with the debut of Miles Morales in the comics. And so, you know, he didn't end up getting cast. They went with Andrew Garfield. Ants. But because of that, there's all these like Donald Glover threads 
now throughout the Spider-Verse, right? Like there's a very tiny cameo in Amazing Spider-Man 1 on the wall behind Andrew Garfield when he's in his dorm room, I think, there's a Donald Glover community oh, poster where he's just like, kind of like, it's just Donald Glover, which doesn't mean much, but you could assume that, okay, great. That could have been Aaron Davis, right? Which is what we get in <laughs> yeah. uh, Spider-Man Homecoming, right? Donald Glover is cast as Aaron Davis, uncle to Miles Morales, right? So that is an MCU whip to the animated universe and is this connective tissue That's right with miles there yeah yeah even though like homecoming came out before into the spider-verse but they're now connected via this aaron davis uh donald glover uh character yeah and in into the spider-verse there was a shot of donald glover as troy in the spider-man uh pajamas on that aaron davis's tv set so, like, that definitely exists. So, through that community connection, that ties in for sure to the animated. Absolutely, right? And that was kind of the genesis of all of this. Donald Glover shows up in Spider-Man pajamas in an episode of Community, and that led to the fan campaign and everything else, right? So, it's like a perfect, yeah. like, 360 complete circle of reference there. Yeah, our, our big Spider-Verse web is really starting to come together. It's actually looking <laughs> like a real web now. Yeah, a, a dragonfly is capable of getting caught in it right now. I don't know that small <laughs> yeah. bugs, I don't know that it's tight enough that small bugs will get yeah. caught but some larger insects yeah the big dumb dragonflies are done oh so now i i just want to cover this because like again poor amazing spider-man those two movies which are watchable the second one is kind of ragged on maybe yeah. rightly so but they're you know whatever uh -huh. they're still spider-man movies we love those right they also are kind of the most isolated <laughs> right because like Subsequent properties don't really reference them that much. And I think because they, they were kind of the first reboot, they didn't want to reference the Raimi stuff too heavily either. I think they were really thinking about standing on their own. So they're kind of on an island. There's not a ton of references going in either direction from those Garfield's uh, Mark Webb movies, except there's a tiny one, and it's a fish-shaped one. Thwip, uh, fwish, in that uh, in Spider-Man Homecoming, Flash Thompson references Branzino. I know when Bronzino's fresh, and that was not fresh, okay? Which is a very specific oh, right. yeah. Mediterranean fish. He's in his car on the way to prom, and he's like, I know what Bronzino should taste like, and that's not it, or something like that, right? Yeah. And of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. the main other pop culture moment of Bronzino was uh, they said it 900 times in Amazing Spider-Man 1 when uh, Peter yeah. first goes over to uh, Gwen Stacy's house and has uh, dinner with her family. Yeah, they're eating Bronzino. A, a New York City cop and his family <laughs> are eating Branzino. They even got some for the kids. All right. Uh, FYI, Branzino, a.k.a. European bass, is a, a very lovely Mediterranean fish. Yeah, you're not, it's, it's no tilapia or salmon. You're not seeing that on a lot of North American tables on a regular basis. I caught you a delicious bass. Because of that, it stands out, right? Wouldn't have been the same if it was yes. chicken fingers yes. they were having. So yep. that that's a, that's a tiny... Thwip between the MCU and the Garfield uh, universe there. Not Tale of Two Kitties. <laughs> but the Damn it. <laughs> we can't get Tale of Two Kitties to cross over. We can find a way to connect it. We'll, we'll do six degrees of spiders to get to uh, our lasagna loving friend. You just need a little guidance, that's all. In my head canon, uh, Tale of Two Kitties connects to all movies. <laughs> it's a Tommy Westfall of a... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the snow globe. <laughs> We're all just specks of dust on that, on that kitty's paw. Um, okay, now we're kind of, we're heading into the um, the more interesting territory of connections here, specifically the ways that this weird villain verse connects to everything, right? And yeah. the big yeah. reveal of that Morbius trailer that came out before the world shut down, right, was at the end of the trailer, we see Michael Keaton as Adrian Toomes, right, the vulture. What's up, Doc? Right. So not only, right, Venom had zero references to Spider-Man. Right? Venom couldn't have the white logo. His his story was completely divorced from the entire MCU. He didn't like deny that there were Avengers or anything like that, but he also didn't acknowledge that there were Avengers or Spider-Man or anything like that. Whereas like, oh, Morbius that also exists in this kind of Spumsy, the Spider-Man something universe. Sony Marvel Pictures, universe of Marvel Characters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, right? Like, oh, 
now it's it's gonna have some connection right to a, a totally uh, a marvel produced spider-man movie which we already saw right in the background we already mentioned that there's a spider-man poster on the wall that morbius runs by and now with this so it's like it does seem like their universes are having much more overlap going forward than they did previously so that's that's a thick that's a thick thwip that's a big old that's a thick whoosh. whip <laughs> oh, that's yeah, that's a thwomp. That's a thwomp seat. Yeah, because that's crazy. The fact that like MCU villains, it'd be like if Thanos showed up in in a Venom movie. It's a huge crossover. I mean, technically, every Spider-Man movie, it's more of a Sony picture than it is a Marvel one. Yes, it is co-produced by Marvel. It's technically part of the MCU, but Sony's name is on the bottom line of it. They're the first title card you see. So all these actors have contracts with Sony. They don't have contracts with Disney. So like, yeah, they have way greater control over how those characters are used. So it just, people like MJ, Ned, uh, Mr. Harrington, Aunt May, they can all definitely appear in any of these movies. So it's, but it's crazy to see a villain yes. show up. I mean, especially one, you know, the, an actor with the stature of Michael Keaton, right? If Michael Keaton were just in Morbius, that would be a big deal, right? Regardless of whether he's playing an established character or not. I, I do yeah. love, I just want to call out the idea of Mr. Harrington showing up in Morbius. Like he's definitely getting like his blood drained, but not enough to die, right? <laughs> like <laughs> he'll have to live and like limp into work the next day with like a band bandage on his neck. Tis but a scratch. <laughs> this will make my wife come back to me, right? Yeah, he plays it for sympathy. <laughs> Whatever it takes. This is the fight of our lives. Life is a precious flower and we should water it together. Well, and, and while we're talking about that Morbius trailer that was rich with detail uh, that you broke down really well, there's also, um, there was a leaked like set photo, right? Of the Daily Bugle with the headline, like, where is Spider-Man? <laughs> Right, somebody took and, and like leaked that. You pointed out that like the, the Daily Bugle like kind of font, it's a print version, right? It's not this kind of newly established yeah. uh, J. Jonah Jameson Infowars website. Yeah, it's the older version. Yes, yeah. and so like that actually is a subtle callback to the Raimi verse. That, I mean, that's the craziest thing, right? Like it'd be one thing if it was another connection to the MCU the way that like Adrian Toomes is. The fact that it's connecting to a different past Spider-Man universe, and that might be the one that J. Jonah Jameson is running. Uh, we did another video breaking down what that could mean, if it's like a different timeline thing, if it means the multiverse, we're in like a different universe, or if it's just like the Infowars thing was what he made out of the ashes of the print version of, uh, of the Daily Bugle. That went out of style. He was kicked out for being too fringe, you know, <laughs> crazy. And then he's like, I'll start my own thing. It turns to frogs gay. <laughs> and that's where he's at in Far From Home post credit. Yes, and maybe, maybe I do love the idea that those two things are like coexisting with like a copyright litigation between them or something yeah. like that. They didn't get the domain name. <laughs> he got the domain name. He's dot .info or something like that. He didn't get the .com. Yeah. But so that, yeah. that's like a, that's like a tiny grade. That's like a thwip. That's like a very, a, a, a spindly little thread. Could just be again, a little yeah, art, a set art photo. department It's joke. not on film yet. Yeah, we don't know that it plays a big plot point. Okay, but somebody that did play a big plot point in that first Venom movie. And again, that movie was largely devoid of, of references to Spider-Man, Marvel, anything like and that. And of joy. <laughs> uh, well, one, <laughs> one like kind of big reference that could have larger implications going forward is the dead astronaut at the beginning, right? And the spacecraft that brings yeah, the Venom yeah. symbiote to Earth, uh, right? That was John Jameson. <laughs> We saw his little name tag said Jameson, who in the comics is the uh -huh. son of J. Jonah Jameson. So that could That's be right. a villain thwip to the Spider MCU, right? The uh, J.K. Simmons uh, version. We don't know if that guy has a son who's an astronaut yet, right? Or could be a uh -huh. thwip to kind of the Raimi verse where we did see Kirsten Dunst's uh, MJ dated an astronaut, right? Uh, John Jameson in the second movie, right? Hell, why not a thwip to both? Let's triangulate these thwips. That's Let's right. catch some tiny fleas. We need total opacity by the end, right? We can't see through this web. I want a good old net. Spiders catch themselves some flies. Uh, a couple ones from the games. And now, of course, there's been a lot of Spider-Man games and they are often like linked with their most recent film counterpart, right? Like the PS2 game, uh -huh was uh, very referential to the Sam Raimi movies. The PS4 game, that's the most recent kind of big one, 
uh, had a lot of references to the current MCU iteration of Spider-Man, right? But like a, a big one, a big connector there to the animated universe was, you know, when they go underground Aunt May's backyard and kind of Spider-Man's bat layer back there and uh, his, his own little bat cave, we see all the different uh, Spider-Man costumes, outfits, and one of them is taken from the games. Yeah, the white logo, PS4 one. Which is a subtle like art whip from the animated universe to the games. Also in that game, uh, Spider-Man, of course, can't like attack civilians because he's a good dude, you know, and you can't go full Grand Theft Auto on anybody, but he can say hello right, to civilians. Right. And one of his hellos is uh -huh. finger guns. Yeah, you which, can do the finger guns, that's all right. It's a subtle Raimi whip, right, to Spider-Man 3's awful dance sequence, right? Yeah, and in that uh, PS4 game, they have uh, the Sanctum Sanctorum, they have Avengers Tower, they have all kinds of stuff that connects to the MCU. Yeah, and like the Sanctum Sanctorum looks like the current MCU version, Yeah, it's right? the same design. Yeah. And um, that, that same bad dance, of course, real quick from Spider-Man 3 also gets referenced in Into the Spider-Verse. During the opening, like alternate universe Peter mentioning, okay, let's Let's not talk about this too much. Speaking of Into the Spider-Verse, another minor thwip there is um, you've pointed out that the voice they use for kind of Uncle Ben in that opening montage is Cliff Curtis, the actor who played Uncle Ben in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man 1. With great power comes great responsibility. With great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, they, they kind of Marlon Brando'd his voice, right? <laughs> when you think of that quote, you think of that actor doing it. So basically he is the the Uncle Ben of that world. So that definitely connects the into the Spider-Verse animated with with the Raimi verse for sure. Especially because like there are a lot of connections in Spider-Verse. I'm just gonna go through a bunch of them real quickly because that is a movie kind of built on the oh, idea yeah. of Spider-Verses and references and things like that. So there's That's a ton, right, yeah. but a lot of them are to the Raimi verse, right? In fact, like it's it's alluded to without directly said that the Peter B. Parker that we spend most of our time with, or the original kind of Peter Parker and Miles's world, kind of both of them or one of them are basically the Tobey Maguire, Peter Parker yeah. kind of. Either the original Spider-Man in his universe is like current Tobey Maguire, or like the Peter B. Parker that he befriends, right, might be like an aged up, right, uh, Toby after mm -hmm. we stop following his adventures kind of an idea, right? And so a few that yeah. we see are like that famous stopping the train uh, with his body. Mm -hmm. We see uh, the car flying through the restaurant window from Spider-Man mm -hmm. 2 that's so great. Of course, Upside Down Kiss we already mentioned, Bad Dancing we already mentioned. Even like the subtle one of Miles, when he gets bit by the radioactive spider in the tunnels, he's taking a photo which is exactly what uh, Tobey Maguire was yeah. doing when the spider bit him, right. right? It's like he's taking it on his phone uh -huh. versus a camera because of course 20 years have passed, but that's a subtle reference. And I mean, this is in a lot of the comics and a lot of the other things, but like, you know, when he webs up Kingpin at the end and leaves him, it's from your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man note on him, which was what, you know, oh, yeah. Toby did in that first one. And, and you know, there, again, there were a lot of things that were like in the comics too, but because Sam Raimi kind of so famously adapted them first, it's hard not to see the Raimi-verse connection there when you see it. Like, with great power comes great responsibility, which was from the very first, you know, Spider-Man appearance in a comic, but like it became so iconic in that Spider-Man 1 movie. So those are all tiny animated twists to the Raimi-verse. And then mm -hmm. maybe the only one, because that Raimi verse was kind of the first thing and so it didn't have anything else to reference besides the comics, right? It's only outward thwip would be this Doctor Strange quote. Doctor Strange. But it's taken. Famously oh, in yeah. Spider-Man 2, while J. Jonah Jameson is talking to Sam Raimi's brother in a cameo appearance, right? I do love that James Gunn and Sam Raimi put their brothers in, in their movies. Why do I not have a brother and why is he not a famous director? <laughs> that's all it takes is just have a brother. Just have a brother. Yeah. That's that's step one. Step one, have a brother. Step two, he has yes. to become a famous director. Right. <laughs> so like while they're uh, spitballing in the newsroom what they're going to call what becomes Dr. Octopus, right? They're, they're throwing out names and mm. they throw out like Dr. Strange. J. Jonah Jameson says, I like it, but it's taken, right? Which acknowledges that there's a Dr. Strange mm. in the Sam Raimi universe. And that's all, we never see him. We don't yeah. know anything else, right? It's just kind of a, a quick joke. But 
And now Sam Raimi's going to direct Doctor Strange 2. Yeah, are we going to get some payoff? Are we going to see the other side of that? Like uh, the Gravity Falls Easter egg where the things go through the portal and then they show back up on Rick and Morty. We're going to see it. We're going to hear an echo of J. Jonah Jameson saying that through some portal. And then we're going to hear that same line come back through. I'm calling it now. Yeah, I mean, it's hard with the current Benedict Cumberbatch, Doctor Strange, like to do the math in your head, right? Like Spider-Man 2 came out, I think in 2004. So like, Mm -hmm. you know, that would have been like 13 years before Doctor Strange, the movie, or, you know, something like that. So like, yeah, he could have been practicing medicine maybe already and like might be well known enough that a random uh, newspaper editor would know his name, even if you weren't, right, the Sorcerer Supreme yet. Right, I mean, he was a renowned surgeon. You might know his name, right? Hey, and and we aren't for sure certain if the Raimi movies are set the release years. You know, they could be kind of like what the X Men movies did—a a, a not too distant future. Uh, we do know they're post 9/11 because they cut out that scene, and uh, so there it was sometime after 2001. That's all we know. But I, it does seem like Sam Raimi's the type of director that is going to use that in some way, right? And like might find a he way better, yeah. to have fun with that, and so that could be. It's a very thin thwip right now, but it has the potential to be a very thick thwip, right? Like, thick! to really pull the Sam Raimi movies into the broader MCU in a way that, like, we never would have thought otherwise possible. Who knows? And then, our final thwip. It's the final stop. This is a giant, like, a 12-roper, right? This is just, like, a thwip out of every finger at the same time, and that's just Stan Lee. Right, he is the connective tissue oh, sure. between everything, right? <laughs> he appeared in every movie up to Endgame. So boom, that's already, right, like dozens of thwips. He also appeared in the PS4 game. He's in Into the Spider-Verse. He's in Mall Rats. <laughs> he gets uh, visual cameos in the Netflix shows. He's a Deadpool. All the all the X-Men movies. All the X-Men movies. I think he was in the Fantastic Four movies as well, yeah, right? He's the a, early he's Fox a movies. Male, he's a postal worker. Yeah. 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 That guy's in all yeah. of Mall rats. <laughs> and then and then he pulls Mall Rats into the MCU, right? Because he's reading the Mall Rats script right. on the train in uh, Captain yeah. Marvel. Which just just what Kevin Smith needed. A little guided missile fan service just for him, right? <laughs> that guy doesn't get enough love. No, no, no. So that's kind of our final big netting of of Thwip. What I like about this is there are all these weird interconnected connections. It, and they could build to something, right? It's already there. If they ever wanted to do something on the level of yeah. a live action Spider-Verse, the groundwork's kind of been laid. Yeah, that that webbing is is pretty tight. If you were to ask me, you're going to catch all kinds of stuff in that web. That's a dangerous web. What a tangled web we weave. That's a web of life and destiny if I've ever seen one. Yeah, while some of the connections are a bit tenuous, some of them are very obvious and very deliberate that, yeah, you're right. I mean, if they want to do a live action Spider-Verse, they they do already have one. Yes, and people have talked about, even if you want to get inside baseball, right? Because the end of the Spider-Verse one was so successful and Venom was surprisingly successful, these kinds of connections might be easier to do in the future, right? Adrian Toomes, Michael Keaton might not be showing up in Morbius if Venom 1 flopped. And people had a lot of right. doubt of if these side characters could support their own movies. And like, there's a lot of speculation, Tobey Maguire himself could show up in a future Spider-Verse movie or something like that. Because again, the, the work is of such high quality and success. Well, uh, one of the reasons we're able to see all these connections is, yeah, as we mentioned before, we've been going back through these Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. And, like, these are movies I had taken a break from for, like, 15 years. So it's been so awesome to go back through them and see, like, what kind of fun moves are already being made. Unfortunately, Spider-Man 3, you know, with Sandman, with uh, James Franco as uh, the new Green Goblin, with Venom, like, uh, and with the weird emo Peter Parker. It kind of sullied it for a lot of people, but it's, uh, those first two movies, really, really solid. And one thing we've been doing is rewatching these with our Discord community that you can access by becoming a patron of New Rockstars at patreon.com slash new rockstars. This Discord is awesome. We have a, a ton of wonderful people, people who have been asking questions for this show. They've been helping us keep this channel alive, keeping content coming out regularly. So doing these rewatches, it's been such a rewarding thing. And just watching the, you know, the videos that come out on the channel is, you know, it's fun and that's why we're doing it at the end of the day. But like, you're really 
really missing out on the conversation that leads to those videos if you're not on Discord. Yeah, so if you can help us out uh, at any level, even if it's like five bucks a month, really any tier, you can get access to our Discord page. So check that out, patreon.com slash new rock stars. And uh, yeah, I think we're ready to move on to some bite-sized questions, yeah? You're you're biting these questions, aren't you, Carrie? <laughs> Yeah, I'll take care. I'll, I got, yeah, I got some answers. Oh, speaking of Discord, right, one of our favorite patrons, uh, that MCU guy, uh, maker oh, of yeah. uh, Nick Fury t-shirts, he sent in, uh, in the time between Infinity War and Endgame, does Stark Industries still exist, right? They seem a bit separated from that life by the time Endgame rolls around. That's true. Well, in Spider-Man Far From Home, Stark Industries did donate that big check to Aunt May's homelessness uh, charity, and it was signed by CEO Pepper Potts herself. <laughs> well, you could say, oh, this is just a check they had. I don't think they would print Stark Industries. Those checks are novelty checks. They're just <laughs> for the show. They're, they're for the publicity. So I don't think they would go to the trouble of doing that if the company wasn't still operational. I, my thinking is that Pepper kept this company alive during the blip period, perhaps Perhaps aiding in relief efforts like damage control. That's what Stark Industries was involved with during Spider-Man Homecoming. And uh, she did have that new armor in Endgame. It's a nod to her rescue armor in the comics in which Pepper Potts becomes like an Iron Man type figure but doing like rescue humanitarian missions, like relief missions. So I think that has been Stark Industries' new stage. They're, they're applying their technology to humanitarian missions around the world. Obviously the world needs that more than anything else. That's great. And that makes sense, right? Like kind of the arc for Stark, right? Like going from like weapons maker to like more like humanitarian was kind of also Tony's arc. And like that, that would be a really cool like corporate story. We also got uh, from Derek Campbell on Twitter, if Groot is speaking a real language, but it just sounds like I am Groot because of his tree anatomy, why didn't Quill's interpreter implant translate it? Yeah, this is like the biggest follow-up question we've had since our Groot episode a couple months back. A lot of people were asking about this. And I'm sure a lot of people will continually will because not everyone watches every second of all of our episodes, but I'll state it here just so I can link it to people. Uh, James Gunn has clarified that in Guardians Volume 1, Peter's implant is not yet a universal implant. And you can see that in the Xandar booking screen. It doesn't say universal translator. Captain Marvel's translator in her movie when she talks to the security guard, she refers to it as universal Peter Quill has like, you know, an off-brand knockoff one, not from like the advanced Kree Star Force. So it doesn't have the Groot language programmed into it yet. Groot language is like a, a rare, obscure, maybe an archaic language. They don't they don't have all of it in there. But as the films progress, and you'll notice starting the Guardians Volume 2 post credit scene, Peter Quill can converse with Groot. He understands him, he calls him out on his swearing, and that's, according to James Gunn, just by exposure. It's years that they've been together, so as they start to be around each other, you start to like pick up on, on inflection points, on nuances, on context, and from there they can see the little variations in the way he says I am Groot, certain emphasis he puts on syllables and uh, <laughs> oots and gros and ams, uh, and they're able to see the wide variety of different language uh, translations there is just by being around him. So it, he doesn't have it in his translator implant. I also, quick shout out, emphasis on the wrong syllable. I first heard that joke in the trailer for A View From The Top, which was a 90s Gwyneth Paltrow, Mike Myers uh, comedy. Ass is the window. It's assess the window. You put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. That's where I heard it. Yeah. That is. I remember that. It, it, and it's in the trailer, and I'd only ever seen the trailer. I recently rewatched the entire movie. Awful. That might be the only joke in the entire movie. <laughs> so that that's my my anti endorsement for this episode. Don't watch a view from the top. Okay, now we will move on to our. We're just gonna call it the box of scraps question. <laughs> box of scraps. Uh, because we used to have a box, but it's it's coming for the box of scraps. Scraps. And our uh, personal question this week asks, what's the craziest first day on the job you've ever had? Well, m mine, mine's a short story, but it's it's interesting, I think. So when I first moved to Los Angeles, and this was 2007, which was kind of the last bad recession we had, and I, I moved to LA and I'm looking for a job, and of course it was a terrible time to be looking for like a first job out of school. And so I'm like applying to everything on Craigslist and like nobody's calling me back. And so I finally get an interview with a place and they're gonna hire me. And so like, like an idiot, I'm just like, yeah, 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 yeah. I like didn't care what the job was. I didn't like look into it, 
whatever. I show up, it was like this guy who's like, it was starting his own social media network. Entrepreneurship. Aimed oh. at like foreign business people, something like that. So I show mm. up, it's in like an office building in West LA, it seemed kind of legit. But the first day I get there, I realize I've been hired to run the company, first off. <laughs> so I, I'm a 23 year old dude who had never had a job before. And then like there are these, he did have these like developers working for him, these like programmers. But like, I, I like went to lunch with one of the programmers the, that first day. And he told me like they were all uh, Malaysian, like young people uh -huh. that like grew up in Malaysia or whatever were living here. And the guy basically told me that the boss was like kind of holding them all hostage for their work visas. <laughs> like, oh, he, no. he, like, cause you know, you're very dependent on your, your employer. Yeah, your to, job, yeah, otherwise you, it, you have to go back. Yeah, and so like they all wanted to be in the US and so they were kind of like, he was maybe like under underpaying them and like not being very honest with them. And like, I quickly oh. like realized like literally in that first day that like he wasn't being honest with me. And like he had this, all these weird habits. Like he could not stop bad mouthing UCLA. <laughs> like he, he thought all people that <laughs> went to specific. the school at UCLA were losers and like low class, which is like- It's It was great... Lane Kiffin. Lane yeah. Kiffin ran this company, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, which, hey, it's a really good school. So I, I quickly realized it was borderline catfishing. This guy was a total fraud who was like taking advantage of all these people. And so I immediately started looking for a next job. I got um, fired the next week. I was of course while at work submitting to other Craigslist jobs because the place was so shady. <laughs> and I accidentally submitted to the same company <laughs> for a similar <laughs> job. <laughs> so they fired me. They're like, you just, That's we just amazing. got your job application for this company. <laughs> so. Wow, so he was organized enough to know that you, uh, yeah. That's a bummer, Zach. <laughs> All those people were counting on you to keep the company intact so they would keep their work visas. You could have saved them. And that, that company became Uber. <laughs> <laughs> I have a similar first uh, day on the job story. My, one of my first jobs in LA was working as a CBS page. I, I think I've referenced it on the show. You know, you wear the red blazers and you escort audiences across TV sets into a, a live studio audience. And uh, we got it. I got that job through a lot of people that uh, Zach and I know from our college improv group. Uh, there was a lot of us got that job. But like my first day on the job, they had me go to a different uh, set. Normally we're at the TV City lot in, uh, in Hollywood. This one was at the CBS Radford lot in Studio City. So I was kind of unfamiliar with where to park. I read the call sheet wrong, so I was like half an hour late. And uh, the audience coordination crew who was working with us kind of chewed me out and they just pegged me as like a problem page. I'm like, I swear I'm good at my job. But like, they were like, just go over. You have to like, you have to help this other guy escort the, the special needs folks because they would have to drive them in golf carts across the lot because they couldn't walk that distance. Well, there's one woman who, I, I don't really know, but according to some other pages, they said that she didn't really need the golf cart. She just didn't feel like walking, but she was like, able-bodied she was completely f capable of walking around they saw her walk up but she and it wasn't the distance from the parking lot to where the audience meet point was further than the distance to the studio but anyway i was not driving the golf cart my uh my buddy josh was and he kept warning her don't lean your leg on uh on the on the side gate of the golf cart because it's not latched that well. But she didn't listen and kept resting her foot on it and he was going around a, a turn. Dude, what are you doing? Not that fast, you know, because they're <laughs> golf carts. But he went around the turn, she rolled out of the golf cart. Thoop, 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 thoop. It was on the ground and Josh like hit the brake was like <gasps> and the woman was just like eh, eh, I'm dead I'm dying and was screaming and we could all hear her screams on the other side of the lot so I run over uh, and then like the other people in the golf cart got around and all the people are circling around and there was two lot security guards who were like, um, because they were the ones who had to respond medically. So they were trying to move her out of the area where like cars were driving through. But like, they, they started to grab, like one had to grab her shoulders, one had to grab her feet. But the other guy grabbing her feet was like, ugh, uh, you, you take her feet. And then, so there's this like argument between these two security guards over how to move her. And I'll never forget, uh, Jerry O'Connell was walking up. He's like, oh, what's going on? And he thought it was just like a bunch of fans who were just standing by his trailer. So he goes over to like, greet him he's like hey hey and he looks down and sees a woman on the ground and she looks at him and goes 
<laughs> and he stares back at her. He's like, I can't be here. And he ran away. <laughs> oh, I love Jerry O'Connell. Jerry O'Connell suddenly was aware. He, he didn't want people to real, think he was responsible for this woman. And poor Josh, he had to, the woman ended up suing and he had to like testify. And uh, there's probably some settlement. It was a big mess. Uh, we still haven't found Jerry O'Connell. He's, <laughs> we don't know. He's, he's still happened. running. It made me wonder what Jerry O'Connell had done. <laughs> that was day one? That was day one? That was my first day on that show, on uh, on that shift. It ended up being the show that I ended up working on for years, actually. Somehow the crew of that show forgave me. as They realized I wasn't a freaking idiot. Maybe they had completely <laughs> forgotten about how I showed up late because this whole thing happened with this woman and Jerry O'Connell. Man, if you ever just want a crazy life of stories and weird celebrity meet and greets, move to LA just for a year and work a couple weird jobs. You'll, you'll get yes. some stories. Yeah, I mean, yeah. L.A. has a lot of very low-paying, hard jobs that have the one yeah. perk of you're likely to bump into some famous people. <laughs> All right, well, that is our show this week. Uh, thank you so much for sending us your questions. And wonderful job, off-screen producer Zach Huddleston. Oh. You nailed it. That Spider-Verse discussion was riveting and Filled with whips that I'll never forget. Whips, 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 whips. Uh, thank you, Eric, for for sherping, sherpa-ing me on this journey to the top of uh, Mount New Rockstars. Thank you, sir. Big question, more like big mistake. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Not at all. And a reminder that you can ask us any question you want on our Discord server. You can become a Discord member by becoming a patron of New Rockstars at patreon.com slash New Rockstars. You can also get audio versions of the show by subscribing to New Rockstars Big Question wherever you get your podcast. Thanks again to people who send questions. You can also send us them on Twitter using the hashtag Big Question and, and tag one of us in it. We'll see it. And you can mail us at our P.O. Box. You can follow me on Instagram at EA Voss. You can follow Zach Huddleston at Z Huddleston on Twitter. Uh, and make sure to follow New Rockstars on all social media channels. Subscribe to New Rockstars so you can get updates on all the stuff you need to know about. Thanks. See you next week.